How are you? Good. How are you? I'm very good. Good Aww. to see you. It's great to see you, sir. You're looking very summery and handsome. Oh, thank you. Oh, of course. What have you been up to? Living the dream, man. Living the dream. <laughs> and what does that you? what does that look like? My family, my boys. I have two young boys and they're getting bigger and it's birthday season in my house. One kid going to driver's ed, the other one going to be 13. It's just beautiful here. And I'm knee deep in my plants and trying to make it through this crazy energy, right? That we're all transmuting. So yeah. How about you? How's it going for you? Looking at what's going on in the UK, which is a reflection of yep. what is going on inside each person. I, I see a time where we won't have this thing of 2000 years of one leader as more and more people are waking up, we don't need one person or one leader or a cabal to tell us the moral, the ethical, the financial. These structures need to break down. And I think they are breaking down. It's not going to happen overnight and everything is going to be kumbaya and it's all sing around the digital campfire. It's not going to be like that. This is Pluto and Aquarius word you're saying and we're and pluto is going to be heading into that space come september 2nd already retrograde going there for the final pass man the death of should that's what i mantra that three years ago when it started to go retrograding back and forth the death of should when i look at the elections the infighting that goes on gosh you guys are like adolescents it's hilarious it's just it's, it's, it's just ridiculous what about an education system that, that is predicated on knowing yourself, understanding your emotions, how to develop relationships, how to engender conflict resolution, how to understand your psychic abilities, how emotional to connect... Emotional intelligence. Emotional intelligence. intelligence. Exactly. Physical, physical intelligence. My children have never stepped foot in a school. And this started, my son's 18 now, going to be 18 in a couple months. And I get a lot of interesting feedback when I tell people, <laughs> but it's not because I don't love education. I devour information. My, my husband and I, our whole point is to keep them intact, to keep their common sense intact, to keep their ability to listen to themselves intact keep them and, sane. and their passion so they go to get that which they love. And it's programming. Nobody rates them if they could take a test or not. During the pandemic, during the lockdown, it was like so many parents, like, I can't do this. I can't teach my children school. I'm like, why not? They said, I don't remember anything. I'm like, so how flippin' important is it to learn all that stuff when nobody remembers anything? It's because there's a difference between memorization and remembering. Mm. Memorization is regurgitation. Unless you have a context or something holistic that grounds it, and then it becomes remembering. Like you don't forget something that you wanted to know for a reason. Now, can my kids read, write, and do math? And we've been reading since they were little. They had to learn how to read. Yeah. They've learned how to write. They want to have an allowance. They got to have a checkbook. They got to do so. They build computers. The ability that they have to think for themselves is off the charts. And you could learn anything when you still want it, when you're hungry. Most kids come out of school, they're like, I ain't never doing that again. They don't know how to eat. They don't know how to care for themselves. They're exhausted and they're deflated because everything they've been promised, I get those clients. All the clients that are like, had all these promises they're like janine i don't know who i am now i love education and you bring up an important point because where are the institutions for wisdom yes and development because we can reach an understanding but the understanding that we need to, to reach is we are offered a covenant in life on earth as the beginnings of a universal acceptance of further life beyond death all major religions throughout the world, they perceive this to be a fundamental tenet. This must lead to the study of the body and the mind and the very process through which we register life, which is the impressions 
that we receive by various conscious parts. Whether we knowingly connect to or not, those impressions are of all kinds. The senses, intuition, our registration of the world, the universe around us. This is our highest food of all. But this is problematic. Why? Because life is a weave or a loom of many dimensional understandings, which cannot be encompassed just in an education as we know it, rather than seeing knowledge as a process of hearing, recalling, and repeating, which is what I was taught at school, let's correct this to perceiving, understanding, and knowing, because the first leads to a storage of data, the second leads to a process of generational well-being in which your knowings are integrated into the way you lead and feel about your life. I wrote these down because I love the words you use, perceiving, understanding, and knowing. And in order to really perceive, you have to be home. You have to not be afraid to come into your body. And then to understand, you have to have other people that can reflect that back to you, how to understand another with some emotional intelligence, right? And then the knowing leaves us to a greater sense of value, of purpose. When you have teachers telling you, no, you don't know that answer. You don't know what you want. Only I know. The measurement of knowing comes by how much you can regurgitate. And Mm. nobody's going to be able to beat the internet. It was so funny. The other day, my son, he wanted to get Grammarly because he was writing. He loves to write. And I'm like, yeah, Grammarly will be great. It'll be a great way to teach you how to form things the way that you want it. Because he wrote this movie he was in, this he created, he was in movie camp. He goes, they have AI now that could help me understand my friend. I go, no, no, I don't want you to use that (laughs) because a little bit is great, but AI It takes everything from everywhere. I go, but it doesn't take it from spirit. I go, Mm. if that computer goes down, you're not going to know who you are on the inside, how you can channel higher information. And it's about, again, being okay and comfortable in your sensory system to be able to perceive, to know, and to find value in that. But it's hard to go here because there's so much wounding and so much disvaluing of self. That's very true. And we have to look at how imagery controls our life. Because when you think about imagery, and I want to be careful here, because it's not simply a picture, a photograph. It goes far beyond those ideas. Because some some images are soon forgotten, while others leave an indelible print in our mind. There are many levels that one can immediately register in the same way that a photograph outside a theatre in no way conveys the full experience of witnessing the play itself. We have to understand not everyone can experience the same images because there is a gatekeeper This gatekeeper is formed by a person's references they've adopted in themselves. If you've got a a complex computer network, you can only gain access to it according to the level of your passcode. We have to create our own self-government by the principles that we adopt because these will become the governors of the way we lead our lives. There's a governing mentality which is formed in childhood up to what I call PU Bertie. And interestingly, if you look at PU on the periodic table is plutonium, which is interesting. That governs you for the rest of your life. If you want to be wise about something, you have to realize that this whole process of impressions and mental imagery governs the way that we think, governs our physiology, governs the mind and the mentality, not necessarily towards any future-based pathfinding endeavor, but a continuation of a historical print, whether it's from parents, yes. cultural, school, because having written the rules, you can only play the game according to them from that point onwards. That's Saturn. That's Capricorn. That's the conditioned response. Now with Pluto stepping out of that, he is stepping into Uranus, and Uranus was discovered... In the 1800s, nobody thought there was a planet beyond Saturn. Saturn, Kronos, Father Time, conditioning. 
the government, the hospitals, all that stuff. So when Uranus was found, he was breakthrough. He was beyond conditioning. I love what you're saying because last time this happened was 1776, give or take a year or two. And yet during that time, we think that it was just the United States that went through it. But the United States then was, it was a domino effect. To all, if you take a look at all the other countries after that, caught wind of that in a certain way, it affected everyone. That was the epicenter. And so we are here again, ready to really the next 20 years, break it down. I remember driving in the car with my son, he was going to Taekwondo and we got nauseous when they first said we had to be locked down. So I'm like, what is going on? But we were still going. It was like that day in we came home and we felt better. And I got this vision that everything had ripped in half, a full on rip in halfness, like karmic. And there will be some beings that will need to continue to want that hierarchy within and without. There's going to be a whole other bandwidth that is ready to move beyond that. And sure enough, like that was February or March of 2020. And then it all unfolded. Mm. And I feel this is precisely especially in America too. It's going to be interesting the next couple of months and then how it leads into the great dissolving next year with Saturn and Aries and Neptune and Aries and they come together and it's going right over that 29th degree uh, of Pisces. And I know that degree very well. It's on the midheaven of my chart in Chiron. So I've lived this my whole life. It is an ultimate surrender of all you've ever known yourself to be. Powerful. Yeah, it's going to be, like you said earlier, it's going to yeah. take a time, but it's here. It's coming from the inside out, right? And no longer allowed to drag the feet anymore. I can, but it's going to feel more intense. It's going to be like walking out of one movie and walking into another movie. Yes. Because there's nothing that I see in this universe, on this planet, that doesn't follow a pattern of decay and death. Always. There's nothing that can nothing. live without something else dying. Always. Which is great because that's part of the cycle. So yes. we're either going to have balancing patterns that come in uh, as part of the evolutionary upgrade or repeating patterns that don't necessarily come in, but ones that we continue to translate in the same historical way in the old movie. Because what we call this side or that side is two sides of the same illusory coin. You know what this reminds me of is, Peter, did you see that classic movie, Shawshank Redemption? Oh, classic. The I ultimate, right? Ultimate. In that movie at the very end, the whole movie, right? The old timer, the gray haired gentleman, he's, he'd been there, what, 40 some, 50 some years. He's like, when I get out of here, this is what I'm going to do. And he led the brigade like in the prison. When he got out, the prison was in the mind. He was mm -hmm. free, couldn't do it. Morgan Freeman gets out. He says, I couldn't even without, not a drop. Those are his words from the program. Without having to feel like I needed to ask. And he almost stole something to go back in. It's one of the best, I got goosebumps just talking about it. Then he's, okay, I'm going to have to let that go. Then he chose otherwise. So the prison, that other movie that you're talking about, often we could imagine that it is going to be something that is so obvious. It's going to call us right to it, like bells and whistles, like we're over here, unicorns, bright colors. It's going to be you sitting there having to make a different choice. This is free will. This is karma. And we create our own. I always love to say to my clients, I've been saying it for years, this life is different than any other. Things are moving so swiftly. And the good news is we don't have to die to be reborn. The bad news, we don't have to die to be reborn. And the reason why that's the bad news is because it's so hard to actually drop that identity. And I don't mean the identity up here, the nervous system identity. Because think about it, and I'm a holistic healer, intuitive empath, so I look at it as a whole body experience when I get the information. I just don't see it as a visual psychic message. If you believe that the current paradigm that we've been living, when you know that is ingrained in your nervous system, you know what the nervous system says? The nervous system says, that's life. Life means go get. Life means look at the news and it's going to feel this way. That's what life feels like. So the minute 
you want to start taking that over as much as your brain's, I wish I had peace. But the minute you want to take that over to the other side and actually have the peace, your body feels like, no, that must be death. That must be death. And it's hard to make the choices away from the people, places, things, jobs, situations, dynamics, inner talk. The food you eat, the things that you do, all the habits, the habituation to come over to this other side. Because initially the body's like, it ain't life, man. This ain't life as I know it. It must be death. So it takes a little bit to say, no, let's give it a shot. And our minds are like, oh, that's so easy. I love going on vacation. Oh, really? Okay. Yes. Who doesn't love that? What about the people in your life that bring you grief? What about that job? I got to I got to keep that for X, Y, Z. I was an IPO trader. For 12 years, I worked my way up. That was the climax of what I did before I left. Late 80s, early 90s. When I left that industry altogether, I knew that I'd waver. This is like the early 2000s. So I got my nose pierced. I got a tattoo my foot and I got rid of all of my clothes. <laughs> so in case I had a weak moment, I'd be like, I can't go back. Because back then they didn't allow like piercings or tattoos. I'd have to buy a whole new wardrobe. So it took me a good five years, probably a little longer, to stop the rhetoric, this internal dialogue that I was lazy or a loser for not having almost completed my day before noon. Because I was doing IPO trading in La Jolla right when I finished. And I had to be at the office by 5.30 to make the market. So practically my whole day was done by noon. My new life, I became a healer. I went straight into my healing school. But it took me a long time to stop the nervous system. Years, in fact. That's about your personal aspects of image. If you look at the right. word image, it's the game of I by anagram. It's important to understand that in your head, it's versatility that produces order. It's not order that produces versatility. It's so hard because we realize, and this is where the hard part is, we don't have to die to have a new life. But realize everything we built is on the old imagery or a better part of our life. And we're like, okay, if this is true, then what does it mean about all that? What I love to tell my clients is, man, if you created that and you were three quarters of the way aligned, half aligned, a quarter aligned with your inner truth, when you become really aligned, all four bodies, four bodies are your babies. If you become really aligned and listen to all four of those bodies every day, you are going to be like all four prongs of a plug in a wall, not just one or two plugs. The whole thing's going to be plugged in. You will be vital and effervescent and things will come. It's going to take a little while. Don't let anybody kid you. Really? And I get so many people who say to me, because when I'm teaching intuition, they'll say, I can't trust that. Why not? I can't trust what I say. Okay. Why? Every time I do something bad happens, tell me. If I speak my truth to my boyfriend, then he doesn't like me anymore. If I speak my truth to my job, they're going to fire me. I'm like, what makes you think that's bad? It's much easier to stay with the comfort, yeah. the comfort. of the story that you tell yourself. Yeah. And your family has told itself and, and the government and the community. Everyone, yeah. Rather than sit with the discomfort of not knowing which means you can step out of that old movie. But the problem is you're relying on the director, but the news flash is you are the director, you are the set manager, you are the script writer, you are the cameraman. You are not an extra starring in your own movie. Precisely what you brought up earlier, that is exactly what most of the culture is programmed to believe the minute they step into school. Again, I love learning and I love school, not the way it's set up now, because I'll say, no, you don't know yourself. If you want to learn something, you listen to me. And it's not even just that numbs out. It distracts them from listening to the power of who they are. And some people, I'm not saying everybody, but a majority of people, they're like, yeah, you could be this, but it's got to be in the confines of this. You could be anything, but you got to learn it this way. There's no sense of feeling tone or ability to redirect them back. I'm all in for order and discernment and things like that, but there's so much of the directors are out there. Somebody in a white coat, somebody standing above you. They don't tell them how to listen to their bodies at all in any way. That's why we need paradigm pioneers to rethink education and embark on a transformative journey 
to cultivate the whole spectrum of human potential and have a holistic approach that encompasses, encompasses not only yeah. intellectual growth, but the yeah. development of intuition, psychic faculties and spiritual connection. We need new framework and foundations for reimagining education that addresses yeah. expanded human technologies. The core principle for me, number one, Recognize each person, each individual is a multidimensional being with untapped potential beyond the five senses. That's number one for me. That's core principle. It's number two is that, that, that there are intuish, intuitive and psychic abilities that are natural human capacities that can be systematically developed. Another core principle is cultivating clairvoyance and mediumship because clear seeing and communication with non-physical realms are skills that can be refined with practice and proper Everybody's guidance. Everybody's psychic. Everybody's right? psychic. Yeah. And another one is every individual has a direct connection to universal consciousness that can be consciously accessed. We have to be able to have the principles of heightened spiritual and psychic awareness because these can enhance not detract from effective functioning in the physical world i looked at this in terms of past lives and why is it people believe in it people don't believe it you have to look at history if you look throughout history you look across cultures the whole concept of reincarnation or the belief that our souls undergo multiple lifetimes that's intrigued and inspired many people, seekers of truth. When we view it through the lens of ancient wisdom traditions and modern scientific inquiry or personal spiritual experiences, we can explore past lives through a gateway that will offer profound insights about who we are and why we're here. Imagine for a moment that the experiences, the talents and challenges that we face today are not just random occurrences, but they're threads woven oh into a larger tapestry of our soul's evolution. What if the fears that you grapple with and the unexplained passions you possess or the inexplicable connections you feel towards certain people and places could be traced back to previous incarnations? When we look at the history of, of, of this, we have to go back and look at the suppression and the resurrection of these beliefs, because for centuries, the whole concept of reincarnation, the belief that souls are reborn into new bodies across different lifetimes, was integral to various spiritual traditions. In ancient Athens, re reincarnation was not just a belief. It was a subject of serious study and teaching at the University of Athens. It was a bastion of knowledge. It became a major center where reincarnation and the mysteries of past lives were explored by scholars and philosophers alike. So the idea that life was a continuous journey through various incarnations was widely accepted and it influenced how people lived, how people died, and how they sought spiritual growth. However, the winds of change began to blow because in the early fourth century, as Christianity gained prominence and eventually became the official religion of the Roman Empire, the whole nature of faith began to shift. So you had this emperor, Justinian. He played a pivotal role in transforming Christianity from personal faith into a powerful instrument of state control. In this new order, Beliefs that allowed individuals to seek their spiritual salvation were seen as threats to the authority of the church and the empire. One of the most significant changes was the ban on the belief in reincarnation. This was not a mere theological disagreement. It was a calculated move to consolidate power because widespread belief in reincarnation posed a direct challenge to the emerging orthodoxy because it empowered individuals to take responsibility for their spiritual journey, diminishing the perceived needs for ecclesiastical intermediaries. Because if people believed 
they can achieve salvation through understanding their past lives and their karma, the authority of the church, and by extension, the emperor, would be undermined. So that whole crackdown on reincarnation really began in earnest in AD 529, when this emperor closed the University of Athens, he silenced one of the last strongholds of this ancient knowledge. The scholars who had devoted their lives to the study of this were forced to flee, seeking refuge in Sufi centers further east. But this emperor's campaign didn't stop there. He went a step further. He declared a belief in reincarnation was heresy. And if we look at the word heresy, the Greek word heresy comes from the Greek heresis, which means choice or to choose. It, at that time, it, it referred simply to a belief or an opinion that deviated from established doctrine. So under this emperor's rule, heresy was redefined from a mere theological error into a serious crime punishable by death. And this shift in the definition of heresy was profound because what had once been a matter of personal belief now became a tool of oppression. That was wielded to enforce conformity, eliminate dissent. Of course, there would be resistance. There always is resistance. So you had this guy, Pope Vigilus, and many other bishops who opposed the ban on reincarnation. Despite their opposition, the emperor carried on. He wasn't going to have any of this. So the pope was arrested, imprisoned. He was eventually formed to sign the anti-reincarnation order. And shortly afterwards, he was freed on his way back to Syracuse. Funnily enough, on his way home, he mysteriously died. He was probably murdered by the emperor's henchmen. The suppression of this knowledge marked the beginning of the Dark Ages. If we look at the Dark Ages, it was a period that was stained with bloodshed and dominated by the tyrannical enforcement of religious orthodoxy. The Holy Inquisition, one of the most famous instruments of this tyranny, ruthlessly hunted down, executed those who dared to hold beliefs that deviated from church doctrine. During those centuries, belief in reincarnation went underground, and it was only kept alive in secretive sects and esoteric circles. We see this even in today's climate, but with all suppressed truths, the belief in reincarnation resurfaced. In the Renaissance, which was a, a time of renewed interest in classical knowledge and spiritual exploration, you had figures like Cosimo de' Medici, who was the Duke of Florence. He began to revive ancient teachings including those on reincarnation. But again, the church quickly moved to stamp those ideas out, forcing them back into the shadows. We have to go back into the shadows to bring out the light. It wasn't until the 19th century, the whole new wave of interest in spirituality began to blossom in the West. And esoteric groups like the Theosophical Society, which was founded by Madame Blavatsky in New York in 1875, she brought all these Eastern spiritual concepts, including reincarnation, to a Western audience. This period marked the beginning of a slow but steady in reintroduction of reincarnation into Western thought. You move into the early 20th century, Rudolf Steiner was the founder of the Anthroposophical Society in 1900, I think it was 1912, and he proclaimed the world was ready to rediscover the concept of reincarnation, just as it had once embraced the Copernican theory of the universe. Those words signaled a turning point because it encouraged a whole new generation to explore the spiritual depths of their lives. There was a whole resurgence of interest which continued in the 20th century in 1956, The Search for Bridie Murphy. I don't know if you know of it. I, I've heard of the book, but I've read it's it. It's incredible because he thrust the concept of past lives into the mainstream. The book basically details the case of a woman under hypnosis. She recalled a past life in the 18th century in Ireland with remarkable detail. This marked the beginning of a broader acceptance of reincarnation, even with some circles of conventional psychology. 
though there were setbacks and bloodshed that marred its history, this belief has endured in reincarnation and re emerged as a powerful tool for personal growth, healing, and understanding, offering profound insights into the human experience. When we continue to explore these mysteries of reincarnation, every relationship, circumstance, and events in our lives can now be seen in a new light, which can offer a deeper understanding of the paths we tread and the journeys that lie ahead. Because Bridie Murphy, there was a fascinating case, if you allow me, I'll just say a little bit about it. Yes. The case significantly influenced the popularization of past life regression and reincarnation beliefs in the 20th century. In 1952, Murray Bernstein, he was a businessman, and he was an amateur hypnotist from Colorado. He embarked on this extraordinary journey that would capture the public's imagination and it ignited widespread interest in past life regression. So Virginia Ty, who was a housewife in, in Pueblo, Colorado, became the subject of Bernstein's hypnotic sessions. While under hypnosis, Virginia began to speak with an Irish accent and identified herself as Bridie Murphy, a woman who lived in 19th century Ireland. Under hypnosis, she recalled detailed aspects of her life, of Bridie Murphy's life in Cork in Ireland. She described her childhood, her family members, her marriage to a man named Sean Bryan Joseph McCarthy, and even details of everyday life in the 19th century. Those descriptions were remarkably vivid and detailed and consistent across multiple sessions. Bernstein was intrigued by her detailed narrative of Bridie Murphy's life. He meticulously documented everything. And he eventually decided to share it with the public. In 1956, he publishes a book titled The Search for Bridie Murphy, which detailed Virginia's sessions and the revelations of Bridie Murphy's life. So what happened? The book quickly became a sensation. It captivated readers with its tale of reincarnation and past life memories. It sparked widespread interest in past life regression and prompted many people to explore the possibility of their own past lives through hypnosis. There was skepticism, there was criticism, there always is saying we could have fabricated or influenced these suggestions during hypnosis. I see this whole concept of past life regression therapy and reincarnation in mainstream media is going to pave the way for further exploration and research into the mysteries of human consciousness and memory, because the case of Bridie Murphy remains one of the most famous examples of past life regression in modern times. Today, it continues to be studied and debated by psychologists, historians, and spiritual seekers, because it's offering a compelling glimpse into the possibility of life beyond our current existence. This search for Bridie Mur Murphy not only brought the concept of past lives into the public eye, but it sparked a broader conversation about the nature of consciousness, memory, and the continuity of the soul across lifetimes. While the specifics of Virginia Ty's experiences remain controversial, this case remains a landmark in the exploration of reincarnation in the human psyche. Peter, honestly, I I have no words <laughs> everything you just said. You told me things that I did not even know about past lives and past lives are the bulk of my work for over 20 years. You soothe my soul because I didn't know this history. I've had this gift since I was younger and I just do it. I have this program called Into the Mystic. I created about seven or eight years ago, but I had been doing it the 15 years prior to that. It involves going to the root chakra, like the root lifetime story in the theme of each chakra to adjust people's energies. I often thought in a general scope of things, I didn't read about it. Oh, I got to do this. Like even when I was younger, I would say past lives. I grew up on the South side of Chicago, Catholic girl. I didn't even know where they came from. It was so in here. And when I learning about this, it was just always here. Now, when I work with my clients, the details, it's 
phenomenal. I do it a little different than past life regressionists with their clients. Instead of them going there, I let them sit back and we're in meditation together and I go there on their behalf so that you said something in here that over time and space, how that affects us. If we have so much trauma and we have unfinished business and things that we couldn't understand, if we had lifetimes that we had to live in it, when you're here now and it's coming to you, it's so you can make peace with it. You can make sense of it. You can integrate it and go in. We get all the details. The witness is the healing. It comes up. It comes out. And I share that with them. I share the name. I share a place. We go deep on the details. We find out what the trauma was. We go what the mastery was because there was a mastery. There's a reason why that past life happened. And then the work doesn't end there. That's a big piece of it. I've had people have massive Herxheimer reactions. If anybody knows what that is, it's a healing reaction. And usually it's a seven week series, usually about week three or four, they're crying. They need a couple weeks because it shifts your biology. And we're attending to the subconscious realm, getting to the root of the issue, because 95% of what we create in the world is subconscious. The minute you witness who that was in that lifetime, whenever the story comes again, you could say, you know what? That was that life. I could nicely organize it, not escape the problem, but say, I know who that was. And here I am, the medicine who can move through that now. And the nervous system begins to adjust. They're not driven by the same people or stories. There's a calm and a shift internally they can't even describe. I look at past lives as well as a child trying to get your attention. I have children. And imagine you and I are having a conversation. My little boy comes in, Mama, look at this drawing that I did. I say, hold on. I'm talking to Peter. I'll be right with you. Mama, look at this. And throws himself on the ground, maybe hits me or something. Little kids, that's what they do. <laughs> and I'm like, give me a minute. And so finally, that's it. They have a total meltdown. I'm like, okay, hold on. And I put Peter on the phone down for a minute on hold. Then I take a look at what they have to show me. And the minute I show them, guess what? They're like, thanks, see you later. They're out of here. These wounds, the past lives that I see in people, they're like, oh my God. When I was younger, X, Y, Z happened to me and it keeps happening. And I thought it was ridiculous. I thought something was wrong with me. Why am I like this now? It all comes from somewhere else, a root. And yet we cannot transcend it. We cannot even grab the wholeness of the mastery until we've put some balm on that trauma and we've integrated it and made sense of it. And this has everything to do with sometimes deeper illnesses that they haven't been able to shake. This work is so important. And you're not kidding, man. I don't even care anymore. Like the things that I see, I could smell these places. I can feel, hey, if I could just have everybody still like me, I would <laughs> like it would be way easier. This stuff is undeniable. And like you said, the amount of details that come through, I learn from it. I learned history from watching other people's past lives. I didn't know that would happen. It's phenomenal. And these people are so altered at the end. They're also empowered because when they walk away, they have a tool bag of lifetimes, seven of them, sometimes a little more, that they're like, I get that now. It's not going to have dominion over me. I'm done with that cycle. I give them tools on how to work with that and really let that old momentum like a pool, everybody gets out of the pool after you make the water spin, just let it fall away because you're done with it. It's over. If you look at Plato and Pythagoras, who were influential ancient philosophers who touched on the concepts of past lives and reincarnation in their teachings, albeit with some differences in their emphasis and interpretation. But Plato, as an example, through his dialogues, particularly in Phaedo, and the Republic discusses the soul's immortality and its transmigration through different bodies over time. He had what's called the theory of recollection. Plato posited that knowledge is innate and that the soul before birth exists in a realm of forms where it possesses knowledge of all things upon birth, but the soul forgets this knowledge but can recollect it through philosophical inquiry and contemplation. This theory implies that 
the soul has existed before birth and will continue to exist even after death, hinting at a form of reincarnation where the soul learns and evolves across lifetimes. Now, in The Republic, he wrote a piece called The Myth of Ur. He presents the myth of Ur, who's a soldier who, after dying in battle, is revived, and he recounts his journey through the afterlife. The myth describes how souls choose their next lives based on their past deeds, suggesting a cycle of rebirth guided by moral accountability and spiritual growth. On the flip side, Pythagoras's view, and he was an ancient philosopher and mathematician, and he also believed in the transmigration of souls and the cyclical nature of life. He taught that souls undergo metempsychosis, which is a transmigration of the soul from one body to another after death. That belief was rooted in the idea that the soul progresses through various life forms, and he included human, animal, and possibly plant oh, yes. life. Yes, oh, all right? the time. Yep, I'm yep. Right. Even the Buddhists do, as a means of purification and learning. This doctrine he viewed as a journey towards harmony and enlightenment, where the soul experiences in each life a contribution to its moral and intellectual development, leading to eventual liberation from the cycle of rebirth. So there are differences and similarities in their views because Plato's view of reincarnation is tied to the soul's quest for knowledge and moral improvement, whereas Pythagoras emphasizes spiritual purification and the attainment of harmony. There's the educational tool versus spiritual evolution. So Plato uses the concept of reincarnation to illustrate philosophical ideas such as the immortality of the soul, the pursuit of truth, while Pythagoras sees it as a means of soul progression towards higher states of existence. And that has influenced Western thought. So they both contributed significantly to the philosophical understanding of reincarnation and past lives in ancient Greece. And their teachings had laid foundational ideas that continue to influence spiritual and philosophical thought on the nature of existence and the soul's journey and the quest for wisdom and enlightenment across lifetimes. Have you ever seen the film Clouds Atlas? Yes. There's a scene of the birthmark connection. First of all, Cloud Atlas, it's an exploration of how the actions of individual lives impact one another in the past and the future. If I recall, I think there were six or seven stories. The individual lives and how they impact one another in the past, present and future as one soul is shaped from a killer into a hero and an act of kindness ripples across centuries to inspire a revolution. One of the most poignant scenes I found that reinforces the whole concept of reincarnation involves the birthmark connection between characters across different time periods. And the birthmark was shaped like a comet. And it appears on various characters' bodies in different lifetimes, symbolizing their interconnected souls and shared identity. It shows how the birthmark appears on those different characters. That visual motif underscores the film's theme of reincarnation and the idea that souls can be linked across time and space. Why is this relevant? I had to watch it twice to get it because it's multi layered, but it illustrates the film exploration of karma, interconnectedness, and the ripple effects of actions across lifetimes. The visual representation of the spiritual and metaphysical concept of reincarnation, where individuals are bound together through multiple lives, but by shared experiences and destinies. That was one movie I thought was amazing. The other movie, very quickly, is what dreams may come. I don't know if you've ever seen that. That was way back of in the- Of course. Yeah, with Robin of Williams. Course. Robin Williams yeah. and Annabelle Sora. Yeah. And his character was Chris Nielsen. He dies to find himself in a heaven more amazing than anything yes. he could have dreamed of. But there's right. one thing missing, his wife. Yes. And, and after he dies, his wife, Annie, kills herself and goes to hell. So Chris, Robin Williams, he decides to risk eternity in Hades for the small chance he'll be able to bring her back to heaven. 
in this movie, What Dreams May Come, a pivotal scene for me that reinforces this concept of past lives and reincarnation is the emotional reunion between the protagonist, Chris Nielsen, played by Robin Williams, and his wife, Annie, played by Annabella uh, Sciorra, in the afterlife. After Chris dies and enters the afterlife, he navigates through different realms to find Annie, who has taken her own life. But their reunion is portrayed as a soulful encounter where their love transcends physical death. That suggests a timeless connection that spans lifetimes. The relevance for me is there's an exploration of themes of eternal love and soulmates and the continuation of relationships beyond death. So the implication here is that their bond existed in previous lives and will continue to exist in future incarnations, again, reinforcing the concept of reincarnation as part of their spiritual journey. Both Cloud Atlas and What Dreams May Come are extremely powerful scenes that depict reincarnation and past lives in evocative ways because those scenes illustrate the concept of souls linked across lifetimes, but also explore themes of love, of destiny, and the eternal nature of the human spirit. The provision of compelling visual narratives that resonated it was an invitation of contemplation on the deeper mysteries of existence and the interconnectedness of our spiritual paths. You are one of my favorite people to talk to. <laughs> Every time we get together, I learn so much from you. And I mean that, honestly, like I'm learning more about the work that I do as I just do it. Like you're giving me the knowledge and you're speaking it so beautifully because there's another movie I'd love to add to that. Tell me if you've seen it, Interstellar with Matthew McConaughey and Jessica Chastain, Anne Hathaway. Yeah, I've seen that. That's another one. I've watched it a few times, but the main piece there too, which, oh my gosh, so delicious in that love is the thread. Love is the stuff that if we are biological beings that don't have more utilitarian uses and we don't have anything beyond what this contained structure is, even if we got a soul, if you go that far into it, when it leaves the body, if we were just meant to be biological and more just here, then why? And they asked this question in the movie. Anne Hathaway asked it, why would we love somebody when they die? Why, if they were just purposeful for us, would we miss them when they're out there in a way? And Matthew McConaughey in this movie, I don't want to give too much away, but he goes to another star system to find life, him and Anne Hathaway and some other super cool astronauts. When they go there, they realize that it's through a wormhole. They got to go to a different time, space, reality. And literally, and I have so much to say about this, but when they go, it adjusts time. An hour for them is 10 years on earth. When that happens, he's able to reach a dimensional reality, time is organized and he could hand pick the moments. Anyway, I, I don't want to say too much because in case people didn't see it, but it's why things happen the whole entire time. Okay. To speak to what you were speaking about, Plato, Pythagoras, and all this stuff is I feel with past lives, it's some of the beliefs that have been ancient is we're going to transcend our way out of here. I don't feel and I don't know, if, but that it isn't so hierarchical, maybe anymore. I only say that because the Earth's vibration and frequency is shifting into a different resonance. This isn't just spiritualism, like NASA found the fourth dimension around Earth. It's dimensional is just frequency. If we have this frequency that we had to hierarchically climb up the ladder and go get, the work I'm doing is adjusting people to be able to live with it in their systems. I had a teacher tell me 20 years ago, Janine, you're getting out of the temple, going into the trenches. And your say about, and I'm right there with it, we do become elements, animals, other beings. And I see our soul on the other side as, okay, I want to understand the nook and cranny of this 
in all of existence. So the only way to do it is to become it. So even time, not to get too deep, but I don't feel, and I haven't seen this for years, that even though I say past lives, I get it. It, it sounds like before and it was, but it's all happening now. So say like you're on the other side going, I really want to learn how to deal with how people kill you for your belief around past life. But you know what I'm going to do? I'm just going to pop my soul right into 528 AD, which by the way, when you told me that story, my whole body got chills. So no doubt I had to be somewhere close to that region. When I see people, it's almost like their soul pops in and out to time frames that are going to give them precisely what they need for their soul to sharpen, to refine, to learn this or that very deeply. Because it's a never expanding universe, it goes on infinitely. I call it a spiritual sommelier. They don't stop refining their ability to taste the things they taste. That refinement, learning of that ability doesn't end. I feel as souls, neither do ours. If we want to know what it means to love something so deeply, we got to have that pain. It's like making a pool. You want to go deep and fill it with joy. You got to go deep. Ram Das has a saying, his guru said to him, some people find God through hunger. Ram's, what does that even mean? And he said, I realized through the years, it meant that when they're starving, then one grain of rice, you can't have that pure enjoyment unless there was that utter suffering. And the last thing I'll say is when I look at this by way of an astrology, like the, the astrological chart and the wheel, Aries is the beginning, the alpha, Pisces is the end, but it's never ending. Everybody gives Aries the bad rap and some people are like, no, I don't want to be the Aries. It's the beginning. I'm like, I'm sorry. Aries is the oneness, the circle with the arrow that just came out of Pisces and is able to embody it now. So it's fabulous, right? But anyway, Aries is passion the warrior. Then you got to go around these 12 archetypal stages of growth. What do you come to at the end? Pisces. What's Pisces? Compassion. What does compassion mean? Come is with, passion is suffering. The way to deeply know something is to constantly go around the cycle and know it from all the angles. That means our soul wants to know it. I had a teacher tell me once, you kill somebody in one lifetime? Next lifetime, you're going to be the person you kill, the mother of the child or the person, the bystander, the doctor. Do you want to go to all the angles? You made a meal, you taste it. You're a victim. How do you think you got there? You made that energy happen. But we want to know. And knowing is this deep embodiment of having been there. For instance, as much as you could be an amazing, compassionate, open-minded dude, you will never know what it feels like to be pregnant until you are in it. That's why so many people who are so compassionate or maybe everybody comes to them to tell them stuff, it's because their soul resonates the suffering. Their soul knows. They don't even need to say it because we're all frequency and the soul's, I get you. And we get them and we don't even understand why. And it comes from lifetimes of having been there. You come to realize that you're giving up nothing in exchange for everything. I love that. Tell me if this is what you're meaning. It may be the hard pill to swallow sometimes that when we get on it, it's quite empowering that we're choosing all of it. Sometimes I'll see a homeless person and I've gone through my ideas of homeless when I'm with my kids and I lived in my car for a bit. Maybe not on that side of the freeway, but I wasn't too far from that. At some points in my life, I moved out very young. But I sit there and I look at them and before I give them money or I give them food, and I'm not saying everybody do what they want to do, but I've come to realize that these people have chosen just one example, an existence where if I um, try to imagine all these things for them, that's fine. But I'm also projecting what I believe their soul wants and needs instead of overly doing and I know how potent prayer is. I know how potent intention is because I work with people who are passing. You come into the room, they're just laying there. Their energy isn't high. So they got all these post-it notes like all over them of what everybody else believes they should have or do or whatever. So instead I look at them and I say, you know what? I wish you the most perfect alignment for what your soul is wanting to extract out of this experience. I wish you the most perfect alignment for that. Maybe that means going deeper in what they're suffering. I'm not turning my back on them. If part of it means want to come over and give me a hug, then okay, that's what we're going to do. But whatever it is, 
who am I to say what I think is better for them? So you wish for people the most perfect alignment, even in their suffering, because they made a meal in one life. This is karma comes and slaps you on the hand. We're artists. We're creator beings. We made this gorgeous meal. Now we get to turn around and taste it. Ooh, that needs a little more sugar. That was a little <laughs> salty. Or, ooh, that was a little too spicy. Maybe I got to chill on the spice. This is how our actions affect. Like you said in the movie, The Cloud Atlas, the action affects so it is infinite. And when we're most aligned is what I love because to get to wrap this back around to what we were talking about in the beginning about conditioning, when we're fully aligned in our spiritual body, which is our will or determination. Now, I believe the soul is separate from the spirit and our mental body and our emotional body and our physical body. When we are aligned in that way and being utterly true kind in the moment, like you could speak your truth. It's not what you say. It's how you say it. But even then not contrived in any way, just utterly true. When we are true in that way, we are not making, dare I say the word timelines, or let me say situations or consequences. When we're not aligned, we're creating things that we don't need to be doing. We're going to have to go down those paths and that's okay. It's going to teach us something like, oh, I was untrue to myself. And I put all my prana, my life force energy into going down this road that I didn't need to go down. But there's no mistakes. You learn, you won't do it again. So we're becoming more refined, more succinct. The more true we are, the more contained our energy becomes. And it's not so splayed out all over the place. We're becoming like a race car driver that's really tight and succinct with how they bring their life force through. Otherwise, we're making lifetimes that are going to be perfect. They're going to teach us everything. Does that make sense? You're making me think about messic principles, the alchemical stages of transformation, the symbolism of what's called nigredo or blackening, which represents the initial stage of an alchemical transformation where the substance undergoes putrefaction and decomposition. The symbology is the dissolution of the ego and the confrontation with one's shadow aspect. That process involves facing the inner darkness, facing the unconscious patterns and unresolved traumas. And it's a phase of purification through inner turmoil and chaos. Then there is the albedo, which is the whitening and the symbolism, which follows the grado, signifies purification and illumination it represents the washing away of impurities and the emergence of clarity and insight in albedo you gain more self-awareness achieve more inner harmony and you begin to integrate opposing forces within your psyche it's a phase of inner refinement and spiritual cleansing then you move into rebedo, which is reddening. That's the final stage of this alchemical transformation, often depicted as the union of opposites. It symbolizes the culmination of spiritual growth and the integration of the higher self and the attainment of enlightenment or spiritual gold. That process involves the realization of one's true self and the manifestation of spiritual potential and the alignment with divine principles. It signifies the rebirth of consciousness into a higher state of awareness and unity with the divine. Now, those stages have to be earned. Yes. States are free, but the stages have to be earned. That is such a potent, like if we could take anything away from this, States are free, stages are earned. This is precisely it because you hear so many people out there saying new timeline is available, new frequency. I'm like, yeah, it's out there. I have to give credit for that to Ken Wilbur because he's the one who said that. When I heard that, the penny dropped for me. That made me think a lot more about these stages of our chemical transformation because states like anger and joy, these are all free. We can experience those. But the stages, the work that has to be done, you really have to earn your stripes. This is where we're at now, surfing from state to state. So I'm seeing it with my clients and people. It's so tricky. And everybody will say things like, we got a new frequency out there. There's new timelines available. I'm like, I'm sorry. They're not available unless you match them. And yeah. so that high vibe 
is asking all of us to let go of the other stuff. Back in January, I did a mantra for the whole year for my tribe was called feel the mastery. And so we've got to go through the alchemical process and choose. And this is why when I do into the mystic, we go to that subconscious stuff. If 95% of what we do is from the subconscious realm, why don't we just go there and get it out of the way? And so we go there to this stuff because it's going to keep coming until we do. And it shows up by way of every situation we've ever had. We have to wean ourselves away from all those activities and prints that right. one has been conditioned to engage in and embracing one of life's greatest challenges. Few people graduate to the place in life where they truly make their own choices because most right. people are bound up by what they've been told is the truth and how we should adapt our lives and our desires to fit into that antiquated paradigm. What do people do? People go around de de decorating their prison with more toys. Shawshank, going right? back. I love that. You know what I love too is that some people, I ask them, why do you want to become psychic? Like when we're doing the work or intuitive or whatever, however you want to word it. Do you believe that you'll never get sick again? Do you believe that it's going to be fluffy and unicorns? And sadly, for me, it goes back to that imagery where we feel that if we become spiritual, it's going to be all this. The minute we start to step into the spiritual programs that are out there or some of the journeys, and not all of them, but some of them, it's not that. It's completely the opposite at first. Because I love what you said with the hermetic stages and the alchemy, where it's got to go to the darkness first. And that in order to purify like when you're making soup, when you're making broth, you put it all in there raw and harsh, and it's got a bubble for a long time. When it's bubbling, if you look into the liquid, you cannot see your reflection. But when it settles down and the heat is drawn out of it, you can start to see your reflection in the calm waters. Bingo. And yes, yeah, that is so profound. Yet the bubbling has to happen because when you throw those buggers in there with a bunch of water and stuff, I mean that by way of the metaphor, just because it's in the mind, because we say we know it. Yep. We got everything on the list. I already see it all. I already know it. I already put it in the container. You got to bring that into your world. You got to let it boil down, distill down. Refine it. It's got to be refined. Refine it. Skim the stuff off the top. Exactly. <laughs> like the status quo mentality has worked really well for our civilization because we're still alive as a species on the oh, planet. Yeah. It's survival. Right? Yes, but, survival. But I see the focus in this life is much more than pure survival, near survival or oh, yeah. status quo. As people continue to slog through their days in that adrenaline producing, personally de demeaning yeah. job, you oh. can make the best of it in a relationship that no longer brings out the best in you. And you're free to live as a highly advanced couch potato, planning your lives around illusionary, vicarious vignettes. Don't you sense that you're naturally designed to be extraordinary? Don't you recognize you can master your craft and profession to the point of adding to it? Don't you sense that you can learn how to orient your life to honor your life and make your life your job and not make your job your life? Our biology gives us hearts and minds and the chance to be fully self-expressed instead of toiling on the earth with my body just to get enough to survive another day. We have the luxury of designing a life exactly as we want it. Not as my parents had, not like you should have. Not like others live their lives, but hey, guess what? you got to start to tell the truth about what you really want in your life and who and what you're becoming and get the help if you need it and get it if you're not sure of what you really want. Find out what is life for you. We have to start swinging the pendulum from the shoulda, coulda, to have a life that we love, to be free to move freely to the far side and settle somewhere in the middle. Let's call that place choice 
or radical responsibility. And that process, that boiling water can be painful, but it can also be glorious. Freedom. Right? It, exactly. It's freedom. It's utter freedom. And you were saying a few things and you said feel and sense. Can you sense that in you? Again, this goes back to, we got to come home mm. and take care of what's going on in this house. The new world is not out there. It's here. And we're all frequency driven beings. And that's just not spiritualism. That's physics. Everything is energy first. Wherever you go, there you are. And so much of the spiritual context that's out, and I love that it's out now, it's, at least it's in conversation, but I see so many people get mixed up and they say, I can't say something bad. The law of attraction, but that's been westernized. Again, that's been used to fit into the current get, the chase. Okay, that's a good start, but that ain't it. Because if you don't rectify some things that are not sitting right in you, the feelings that you're having about something, wherever you go, there you are. You're pinging constantly. That's what I read. I read people's energy. And if they're pinging, great stuff. Law of attraction. Excuse me. Law of attraction is our default mode. The practice of it is just asking you to be present. You mm. cannot control your end game by law of attraction. You can. Trust me. I've been studying this for years. Personally, you can do it for only so long until you deal with the other stuff you came in here with, because that energy is in here as well. And wherever you go, there you are. We are here to integrate that saying, no, the good stuff is only the top of the flower is the only good stuff, not the roots. Yuck. That's under the dirt. It's squishy and turny and they're dirty and gross. We're holistic beings. So being able to understand that and embrace all of the things that we are takes the charge and removes the distance away from this ability we have to sense who we are, to see what we're capable of. But in order to sense it, we have to sense the other stuff too. Like for instance, I talk to dead people. I tell my boys, that's okay. You can tell me your words, which I fully listen to and hear, but I hear the inside stuff. <laughs> Too bad for them. It's rough. But anybody like that, I hear what goes on. I turn it off. The upside is that's a gift. You know what the downside is? I feel everything. My pain, this is not a measurement, but let's face it. When you become refined like this, do you think that sommelier who's the great wine taster, do you think he's got a box of Gallo with a keg top in his fridge? No, that dude, I didn't drink wine at this party because it wasn't good enough. I need to have, and this is the courage we need because it requires us to be even more truthful as we go. One thing we had mentioned earlier about children, and this is something we could all do at home, and it happened to me growing up. No fault of my parents. Who doesn't want to do this on occasion? I would walk into a room and I could tell something was wrong. And I'd say, what's wrong? Nothing. You're making it up. You want to say something different. You're not telling me or I'm feeling something. No, you're too sensitive. You're making it up. So with my children, my husband's a healer as well. So we made a promise that if we're feeling something and the child can sense it, we acknowledge it. Because for years, I had to rectify and come back to this belief, oh my gosh, I must be wrong. If I'm sensing it, I must be wrong. Because I usually am. My parents told me I was wrong. My family told me I was wrong. Other friends told me I was wrong. But basically that where I grew up, the unit I grew up in. Now we tell our kids, my kids will come in. Oh, what's wrong with mom? I'm like, you're right. Something's up. It's not about you. If it is, you'd hear me because we're very communicative. I'm taking a minute to shift my emotions from understanding this to that. Give me a minute. Or it's mom and dad stuff. You're spot on, but you're okay. Then they don't question. They need to keep that sensory ability intact. This is part of the new world is to say not to just dismiss. No, I'm fine. What is that? Spiritual needs to be fine and happy slappy and just good. No, truth. I fully believe that Buddha is smiling because he just flips someone off for driving over his feet with a cart and he's not upset about it. That's the thing of detachment. When you're attached to judgment, yes, then you don't find love. If you're in judgment all the time, self-judgment and judgment towards other people, other things, situations, you never find the self-love that you need to be able to understand that 
you remove the fact that there's always a spark of love that is close to you. It's always close to you. But if you're distracted by judgment, internal chatter and ancillary nonsense, then you find yourself consumed by your thoughts and endless mental noise, which makes it really hard to focus on the presence of the spark of life from a higher power. That higher power is within you. It's not something up there or down here. or over. It's within you. Despite all these distractions, there remains an ever-present spark of life and vitality within us that originates from a higher power that is always close to us. In a world veering towards technocratic dystopia, it's crucial to reconnect with the essence of being human and connecting with the infinite within us and to connect with the essence of humanity. Human beings have started a race and dropped the care. Look at the word race, it's care by anagram. And it's run its mile. We don't need arbiters that tell us how we should think. We need to get a true education about this human technology. Yes, it's got all of its automatic processes. You don't have to think about your liver or your lungs. It's all automatic. It's happening within you all the time. And your body is always in the present. It's your mind can be all over the place. It's always there. It's a universe in waiting. It wants to connect with you. There's the growing risk of losing touch with what it means to be truly human and to fulfill our human purpose, whatever that is for you. For me, it's to learn to connect with the infinite, with what resides closest to us, which is within ourselves. The life without is shallow. A life without the sacred is shallow. There are so many paths we have today that can lead to the perception of the universe's beauty and love. There's some rare individuals out there that deeply understand reality and are transformed by this. To me, it's the importance and the awareness of the sacred and living without growing awareness of the sacred aspects of life results in a shallow and superficial existence. There are numerous ways to perceive the inherent beauty and love in the universe. I'm not a gardener, but I have an olive tree in my backyard and I've got help to nurture it back to life. I love to see it grow each day. What do I see? I see the one third of its life. The two thirds are under the soil. Hey, guess what? There's a two thirds, one third principle at play. Look at my finger. It's got three parts to it, but I can only move two thirds at one time. You've got conscious, semi-conscious, unconscious. You can only be in two thirds of it at one time. When you start to see these natural laws, the beauty is overwhelming. When my neighbor comes over who does the garden, he loves to get his hands in the soil because he feels Mother Earth. He feels that connection to it that floods his energy systems, that seeps into his sinews. What is success for him? Success for him is the love of making sure that seedling gets nurtured. That's success to him. It's not about big fat bank account or the Maserati in the driveway. Success for him is the love, the transformation, the penetration deeply into the nature of reality that profoundly transforms his experience in the garden. Or the homemaker who wants to create a beautiful home because that's what she deliberately decides to do. That's success. That's success. You said sacred, and in order to allow ourselves to go to that inner sacred and let that be our success, a big piece of that is trusting the path that may take us on, and that really is the unknown. It's trusting the unknown. But if I go down this road, it won't give me all the things that society said that I need to do to be comforted and cared for. I get it. I was in the gilded cage and I was good at it. 401k plan, insurance, bonuses, made my salary, good money. But I was the lion in the cage, man. Guy in his khakis would come in every day, throw me a piece of raw meat. Or do you want to be that lion 
running out in nature and being a lion, getting a gazelle and having to wait a couple of weeks until you find the next pack of whatever. The unknown is part of it. I feel when we step into this Aquarian age, which we are on our way, the opposite of Aquarius is Leo. And in traditional astrology, they say opposite. I don't use that word. I learned years ago in my 5D astrology from my teacher, Stephanie Azaria, the way that she looks at through 5D astrology, the eyes of oppositions is that they're on a bridge. To me, they're the bridge. They're two sides of the same coin. They're adjacencies. I love that. Adjacencies. So they're essential to one another. They get each other more than anyone. They're not fighting each other. They get it. Their core values are the same. They just express it differently. Thank goodness. Like my husband and I, we're, oh my God, the dude is so chill. He would make the Dalai Lama look like a rager. Like my husband is so sweet and chill. And then there's this, right? <laughs> and, so, and so I tease his, his brother. I have corrupted your DNA. <laughs> I'm a little loud. But my husband, when I lay on his lap, for, when we first started dating, I never saw the end of a movie because I would be passed out like in 10 minutes. I get a little fire under his booty. You know what I mean? Because too chill. I get the same value system. Back to Aquarius and Leo. Leo is the medicine for this Aquarian age. It's its anchor point because they literally stand across the sky from each other in the chart, in the heavens. And Leo is the heart and it's a lion. It's saying, I am listening to all four chambers of my heart. In medical astrology, it's the heart as well. It lives right next door to Virgo. Virgo is the holistic healer. They're both mothers. Cancer's the earth mother. Virgo's the divine mother. And Leo is infused by its own truth. It stays in its truth like the sun. It's the ruler is the sun. The sun constantly is connecting to the higher source to bring its light. It's about creativity. It's about what is your joy? What do you love? You said love a million times. What do we love? In order to do that, we got to feel. It's about the strength and the stability of being in that heart all the time. So in order to work through the Aquarian age, which is tons of information and computers and this and that, we're going to have so much information. Can we be comfortable with the unknown? When you fall in love, you're just feeling it in the moment. You have no clue where it's going to take you. You're like, uh-oh, here I go. And this may not be good. <laughs> the lion gets out of the cage. It's, oh, geez, give me that gazelle. And I'm a total lion. And then it's, oh, where's the guy with the khakis? Where is he? Is he going to come give me my slab of meat? There's the unknown principle requires us to be connected to spirit. And this is the importance of this Neptune in Pisces and Saturn in Pisces once in a 30 year cycle. We have to get serious about our spirituality. It isn't just the words. That's a good start. It isn't just the prayers. That's a good start, but we're growing even beyond that. It isn't just the law of attraction, the vision boards, great start. It's about, can you step into every day of your life and trust what your heart wants and needs to speak and have in your existence? That's the medicine. Can you be different? That's the medicine. Uranus is different. Leo is like, hey, I'm just me, man. Leo is different. The leader of the pack. Can you be driven by your wholeness of what you need and hold hands with the unknown? At a time where everything is known, they're going to put a lot of, oh, but we know this and we know that. Okay, good for you. We're still channeling. Do you get what I'm saying? This is the problem I have with new age models. Because there is a failure to understand that, yes, law of attraction and thinking positively and saying prayers and affirmations and denying negative thoughts and listening to gurus and famous speakers, they all have an impact, but it's temporary because you cannot release that which is locked in the deep canyons of your unconscious mind. If you are completely oblivious to it, which most of us are, otherwise it wouldn't be unconscious. It's under the domination of a sick thought system yes. that is shared on both a collective and individual level. This is right. why I say human beings are prone to self-deception, but they're also prone to theater of communal deception. Yeah. This collective deception, which leads people to this false universe, that will remain the case until we start to, as Socrates said, the unexamined life is not worth living. So we need to examine our life. We need to 
replace the way we think about things, the way we feel about things. The structure, the bones. Exactly. The hidden beliefs will continue to dominate and assert themselves in a predetermined way because this world is like a symbolic scenario. We've all agreed to participate in it. The more things change, the more things stay the same. What's the possible way we can teach ourselves to see? Because if my judgment is poor and it creates a history that repeats itself in well-trodden roots, because I've heard the truth will set you free. That's true, but nobody's told me what the truth is. Oh, the kingdom of heaven is within you. That's true as well. But how do you get there? Sensing, feeling, being yeah. home, trusting that, honoring right. that. We get to rebirth that. We get to be allowed to do it. Say, for instance, as children, we weren't allowed to do it. Parents wouldn't let us. School system wouldn't let us. We have to go to the bathroom. I don't know. Got to raise my hand. I can't tell you how many homeschool friends of ours have tried to, the kids are like, I want to go. And they go and they're like, oh my gosh, I got to go to the bathroom. Teacher's too bad. You got to go five minutes in between this class and that class. They have to shut off listening to their system. The reason why I bring this up is because this is a big piece of nervous system regulation. The reason why a lot of people can't handle emotional intensity or things happening in their life or they just shut down is because their nervous systems are so piled upon. They're not regulated. They, they don't mm. know when they have to go to the bathroom. They don't know when they're thirsty. They just listen to the script. These are precisely the things that I work with my clients to reprogram their systems so they could come in and hear spirits even more. You got to come in and be able to listen to the biology and build a relationship with your sensory system. If you had a guitar and no doubt Eric Clampton's got like a gazillion different guitars, Eddie Van Halen. Rest his soul had a gazillion different guitars, but each one he had to get to know. Each one sounds differently. You get into a different car, it drives a little different than the other. So you got to come to know this. It's not just about listening to spirit and meditating. Good start. It's about listening to this. Are you tired? Do you override that? Do you just keep going? Says who? And wear that as a badge of honor. And wear it as, oh yeah, as a badge of honor. These are the things, the conditioned responses that, again, the new world, we get to unwind this. And I truly feel that the beautiful children that are born now, I believe fully that nature knows precisely what it's doing. So oh, these yes. children with special needs, it's not like we need to come and make them like us. There's a larger call. They're saying, slow down. I don't want to go into that room. Our sensory system is too heightened. So these children, nature, the next generation is inviting us to be different with our biology, not to take them and try to cram them into the current paradigm. Oh, no, slow down. Maybe school ain't right for them. Maybe that food ain't, isn't right for them. Maybe. So let's explore. And our love for our children will take us there because we're not listening. Otherwise, we're overriding our own soul system and we could do it. One other movie I want to say that reminded me is Vanilla Sky. Did you oh, see yeah, that? Oh, yeah, great movie. Yeah. And at the end, again, I won't, we won't give it away, but you'll see. At the end, it's Tom Cruise, Kurt Russell, Cameron Diaz, like tons of great people. Kurt Russell plays his ego. And he's always telling them, like you said before, we, that inside here, which are all the voices of the authorities, authority, author, are we letting them be the author of our life or are we being the author of our life? But in Vanilla Sky, Kurt Russell was like, dude, you don't want to do this. He gives him all the reason not to be himself. He gives him all the reasons why he needs to continue doing what he was doing. Kurt was that ego saying, no, you're going to be wrong. It's going to be bad. You're going to die if you do this. Because the ego doesn't want to die. It's the medicine of the Aquarian age. Leo, mm -hmm. courage, boldness, authenticity, loyalty to self, loyalty to that which we love, those children, an environment being the change we wish to see in the world. It's great to do things out in the world. What's happening at home? Is it peaceful here? And this is where it takes the courage to tear down some walls and kick up some dust and maybe check behind the walls and get that plumbing redone, open up that can of worms. I like the can of worms because it's still <laughs> living there, whether we look at it or not. New world's on the inside. Definitely. And it's an inside job. I know that's a cliche. I don't descend into cliches, but it really yeah. is. That's the pyramid of plasma. You look at 
pyramid or the actual word is pyramid fire in the middle fire in the middle oh my gosh i love right? that <laughs> if you look at that in spirituality and you look at the fact they've been associated with many spiritual and mystical properties in various cultures particularly ancient egypt and right. south america but they're seen as conduits of energy or portals to higher dimensions I, I refer that to a spiritual construct or experience where one perceives or interacts with a higher vibrational energies in a pyramid-like structure or form. That's the pyramid of plasma. We know there's subtle energy bodies that surround the physical body. The pyramid yes. of plasma is like a visualization technique or a phenomenon that's related to these energy fields. This is also related to spiritual ascension, where one moves up through different energetic layers or dimensions. And there's a sacred geometry in all of this, because the idea of plasma as a high energy state, this represents a potent spiritual symbol or tool for energy work and meditation. This whole pyramidal shape these geometric shapes or structures, whether it's meditation or quiet time, we are, in a sense, building that pyramid of plasma within ourselves, within our subtle bodies. I love that. I right? love that. So we start to move towards a crystalline structure that is what now is being called homo luminous. Yes. Yeah. I love that. And what I love, too, is... The strength that's really, the visual I get when I see a pyramid, the strength that is down below, when you look at the body as a chakra system, the heart being that very center, I often say that the body is like a big city building. When you're in the mind, you can see so much, right? Far and wide, but you're also away from the sounds and the smells and the feelings and the splatters of rain. You're away from the connection to earth. You have a great view. You're detached. The brain is detached from down here, but it's about somehow being in that middle so you can still smell the awesome restaurants. You can still hear a little bit of the people or having a strong foundation, which requires most of that energy. Like when you just look at a pyramid being in bodied, we are too much of the mind. It's like an upside down pyramid. It's not balanced at all. The price you pay in development is the long-term fraction of what you create. Yes. I love that because we got to right. live that play out and then we got to redo it when we change, unpack that, let it dissolve. We're going to have a lot of help over the next couple of years with this dissolving. It's already happening. Neptune at the 29th degree, like we said, Saturn is there. When they come together next year, Saturn in Aries is the I am, it's the actual ego and solidifying that. But then Neptune's going to come in and everything Neptune touches, it dissolves. I feel when they come together, there's many interpretations of this, but a big hit is if we want to redo that old identity, of course, we have free will. We could just keep going and deliver system identity and even how that plays out in the world. But we're going to have a chance to dissolve. It's going to help those that are ready to let go of that old ego and those that aren't ready to let go. It's going to be that wake up moment of the old world is just going to start to crumble and fall away. If you want well-being in your life, it's not an ability you're born with. It's a freedom you have to learn. And then you have to relearn and then you have to unlearn it. That's where you find the freedom. It is true. And just like we said earlier, it's the good news is we don't have to die to have a rebirth. The bad news is we don't have to die. So it's a little tricky, but we can all get there. Going one feeling at a time and trusting you, even if it doesn't look pretty when you trust it, just clear in the way, trust you more than what you hear out there. What I love about our time now is when we put it out there, we can find it. When we really in our heart commit to it, look, you and I are on the other side of the world. You think back in the day, what do we say? That was 528 AD, 529 AD. We would be able to have this conversation about past lives. If you were on one side of the world and I was on the other, we wouldn't feel that camaraderie. We wouldn't feel that resourcefulness or that connection. We wouldn't have it. I would rather be living in this time than being right. a rich emperor of the Roman Empire. Just think yeah. of what you had to do to send a message to somebody. All the things that we have today, we can right. now use. 
you so know, people can find it. People can find the help, the support, and it's accepted to even explore it. Yeah. Have there's such a freedom now and a resourcefulness that's available to each of us to find our way. So it's here. It's a beautiful time to transcend. Yep. I want to say this has been an incredible conversation. I love dialoguing with you. And may you. you feel the sacredness of all that you are, all that surrounds you, and all that we are together. Thank you so much, Janine. Peter, you are so welcome. Thank you always for having me. You are a wordsmith. I love what you bring. And you taught me so much today about past lives. I didn't even know. That filled my soul. It gave me something to be really happy about. So thank you, sir, for having me. It's more about substance than sound bites. That's what I look for is how can we explore these mysteries, these wonders, not exploit them, but explore them. We can facilitate a dialogue as distinct from manipulating someone for a soundbite. We're in an exploration phase, not an exploitative phase. One will give you sound bites, one will give you substance. I just have goosebumps all over my body. I never thought to put those words together. And you just pretty much in a nutshell described how I've been feeling in general with the ether and my selectiveness around who I share with. And it's sacred to not exploit, especially type of work that you and I are chatting together or the work that I do with my Into the Mystic. You have to want it. You have to seek it out. Can't be that easy. You got to be hungry for it in order for it to meet you, ask for that. And that's a powerful aphrodisiac because when you do that, then it seeks you out. And that's the tuning fork principle where everything is acting in resonance and in sympathy with each other. So there's mutual co-shaping and co-mingling that can then enhance and elevate what I see is part of the human deal. And here we are. That's the perfect... Description of the Aquarian age. <laughs> Thank you. You're what like we, an angel, man. What's been your experience today? I'm not kidding. Like you had me crying. What? Yeah. The path for me hasn't been easy. When you spoke of the history of past lives, I did not even know this. I'm not kidding. I just started taking a homeopathic remedy, very special from the temple of Dodona in Greece. I did not know any of this. I literally had lived by way of what my heart tells me to do, and I bring it to my clients. I've been doing it for 25 years. Then you give me this history, and my body was just goosebumps everywhere. Oh my gosh, this is what I'm a part of. I'm almost 60, man. I just turned 57, and I've been sitting here living the better part of my life with people thinking I'm just crazy. I learned not to care, obviously, because here we are. To hear this was like the oasis in the desert, like just how you took it seriously, you did research, the richness of it, your words, the way you put words together. I wrote them down, literally, look at these notes. Oh my gosh. <laughs> oh my God, dude, the things that you said, just the spiritual muggles, like that was hilarious. <laughs> All over. I just enjoyed every minute of it, Peter. I appreciate your soul, man. Thank just, you. It's just beautiful work that you do. God, I, I love it. I trust I'm uh, on track and on time and in tune with the cyclical wash of this universal covenant that I feel is a grant and a grace and a sacred and staggering responsibility to be able to respond to that subpoena because we all have a rendezvous with a future that isn't about maintaining the status quo. You're so refreshing to me. I keep saying Oasis. We do the work, we carry on, we trudge, and then there's this. That's what I felt like today. Beautiful. Thank you That's so beautiful. much, Peter. You're I'm going to carry welcome. this with me for ultra long time. I appreciate you. I appreciate you too for giving me the opportunity to voice all these things, which is a gift. So I really want to thank you for that, for your patience, for your active listening I love your energy. I love the insights you have. The fact that you give grace and proportion to the conversation with your effervescence and inner potency, you're a force of nature. I will 
take that from my birthday. It was just a few days ago. So oh, really? Little, yummy little gift for me. Thank you, sir. Have a beautiful day. You too. Bye. Okay. Bye-bye. Thank you.